think we're live now. Yes. So I think we can go ahead and go ahead and begin. So good good morning, everyone, and especially for those of you in Europe, a very good and very early morning. Uh, we uh, welcome this session on uh, resilient uh, India. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I'm supposed to just start, by the way, uh, Marut or and uh, uh, Frank, or do you, is there an is there an introduction? I think we can just start, right? I'm not sure anyone else can speak, so we'll just go ahead and start. Um, so uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, we have a we have a great panel with us this morning to talk about resilient India. Um, Vikram Kirloskar, uh, everyone knows, past president of CI, um, the, uh, the 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 vice chairman of Toyota, Kirloskar, um, and has wide experience in uh, in the engineering industry uh, in India, and uh, uh, he's sort of uh, he's sort of my guru for all things manufacturing uh, in the country. Um, and uh, Vikram, some, at some point, we should talk about that, too, uh, in our session. Uh, Rekha Menon is the uh, head uh, of Accenture uh, in India and has wide experience covering work in many, many different industries. Uh, and Dinesh is uh, with TVS Logistics. Uh, Dinesh is uh, also... Uh, very connected with CI, has been class chair of the Southern region, um, runs a very successful logistics business, runs also chairs the CI Logistics Institute uh, in, uh, in, in, based in Chennai um, and has a very successful uh, subsidiary in Singapore. So uh, what we thought we would do is, uh, uh, is talk a little bit about how our own experience has been in this last uh, 16 months. Uh, you know, I'll make uh, two minutes of introductory comments, which is uh, there's been the, the experience has obviously, as for many, been good and bad. Uh, and if you look overall at the Indian economy, uh, the good part is that the recovery from the first lockdowns last year were more rapid than projected. Uh, and again, after the second wave, uh, that we have experienced in April and May, the recovery has been more rapid than projected. I mean, I think we've all been surprised, um, <laughs> uh, as 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 shown especially in the traffic on our streets, at how rapid uh, the recovery from a very a very deep and devastating second wave has been. Um, the we learned a lot in the second wave. Uh, we learned from the first set of lockdowns. The restrictions on movement were much more reasonable. Uh, they were left largely to the states. Um, even though the health crisis was much more severe, uh, the actual impact on the economy uh, was probably much more modest. Um, the, the bad bit is really concerns for the longer term. Um, you know, what... What is the long-term effect on the employment rate? Uh, what we've seen uh, at the end of uh, the second wave uh, is that the employment rate in the country, uh, the total number of people employed is about 17 million fewer. If you go by uh, a think tank that measures these things, uh, their, their estimates, CMIE. Um, and this is particularly a reflection of uh, uh, some, some sectors that have been devastated in India mm -hmm. as elsewhere in the world. Uh, the hotels and hospitality sector, of course, um, but also retail and to some extent construction. So with those introductory comments, uh, we thought we would go straight into uh, a round of questions. Um, and we thought we'd start by talking about our own direct experience in our own firms uh, of these last 16 months. You know, how has this last 16 months been? How was the last year for us? Uh, the Indian financial year runs April to March. How was the last year for us? How was Q1, uh, the first quarter of this year for us? Um, and, uh, uh, and, and then some reflections of your own experience for your firm and then for your wider industry. Uh, do you feel that your experience as a firm was typical 
uh, of the industry do you feel it uh, stood out uh, in some way? So uh, I'll start first with uh, uh, Rekha Min and come to you and then I'll go to Dinesh and then I'll come to Bikram. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. Speaking both for uh, my firm, that's Accenture, and then speaking for my industry as chair for NASA, uh, which is technology industry in India, I have to say, like all of us, uh, this has been the COVID pandemic has been a historic event and it will define our future, both as individuals, but also as society and businesses. For us, um, the crisis really was a um, testing point of our foundations and it presented a business continuity challenge, but it also uh, was a humanitarian crisis, as we all know. Uh, and for us in India, for Accenture in India, what helped us was that we invested very early in our world class infrastructure. So we are 95 percent cloud and our over 200,000 people are all tech enabled. So it got us, allowed us to move to work from home fairly seamlessly um, and continue to deliver to our clients. So I have to say the impact to us was fairly minimal. Our, uh, uh, and not just that, uh, there was very strong industry collaboration. So, you know, looking after people, looking after people <coughs> mental health and continuing to grow. Uh, we've actually grown uh, through this year. And you asked how we've done in the last quarter. Um, so just taking our results for the last quarter, we uh, we grew. Um, our revenues were about 13.3 billion in the last quarter. And um, it's been record new bookings for us. Uh, so we've shown very strong growth over the last few quarters. And we've actually raised our uh, guidance um, with very good prof profitability and free cash flow. And that's the same thing that the rest of the Indian tech industry experienced, actually. Um, if we just look at their H2 results versus H1, um, the top uh, listed technology companies actually recorded an increase of about roughly about 5%. So the experience was the same. Uh, in terms of one, um, resilience, agility, being able to move very quickly, um, collaborating very, very carefully. Um, and what's also happened is that we've seen, all of us have seen new opportunities come our way. Uh, because as we all know, the world got disrupted and then every business became a digital business. Um, the uh, uh, status quo for businesses change like all your businesses because whether it's changing consumer preferences or business model reinventions or restructuring supply chain or assumptions about how work is done uh, all that actually accelerated the uh, adoption of technology and actually compressed uh, uh, transformation in each of the companies and India tech sector Accenture we've all benefited from that um, so that's, I would say that the Indian tech industry is in a rather privileged position um, because uh, it has been through the last year, but it's also an opportunity for us um, for helping not just organizations, but economies and societies transform and do as we go forward. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Rekha. Thanks. Have you, have you, by the way, found that uh, it's been possible to take on whole projects for a client overseas without ever visiting them? Absolutely. Uh, so that's the new normal. Mm. We've realized that none of the clients had to visit us. We have managed, as I just shared, we've grown both yeah. venture and the industry with zero travel, no client visits, um, taking on complete large projects globally. And this is true across the world and especially true for India. Thanks. So uh, let me come to Dinesh next. Dinesh, you know, you, you run a, a very successful business based in Chennai, um, but you also have a business in Singapore. And one of the uh, one of the distinct things is that not only has Singapore handled the entire pandemic very well, uh, but one of the ways in which they've handled it very well is by not letting anyone in. Uh, so it's probably been impossible to go visit. Uh, you know, probably for the you've probably not made any visits to Singapore for the first time in years and years and years is what I would guess. You know, so how is how is the experience been of uh, not just running your business in Chennai, but running your business in Singapore without ever meeting them? 
Thanks, Noshad. Uh, I mean, to tell you the truth, uh, even other global operations I have not been able to visit. So <laughs> you are right. I mean, it's been an uh, incredible experience of trying to manage things uh, sitting uh, here rather than doing. But like Rekha said, I think we have now almost got used to the norm- new normal. And uh, our business is actually, phys- I mean, physical, right? It's hands-on, meaning I re- we really can't remote manage. So you have to have people at the ground level. So if, actually, if, let me step back and say that for us, the pandemic was the biggest learning in terms of moving into a paperless mode of first managing customer relationships and uh, managing deliveries, etc. on a full paperless mode. Because on a B2C, I think that was always common. But on a B2B, it was, so to say, a big step forward for most companies to move into the paperless mode. The second issue, I think the initial phase when things were pretty bad, I think globally, we actually found better response. And as you said, Singapore was a classical example of where at least locally we were able to do uh, fairly good uh, business volumes. But post, I think, June of uh, last year till the first quarter of this year, I think across the globe now people have started getting used to the fact that uh, supply chain outsourcing has become more uh, relevant for people. And I would say the total addressable market for the supply chain sector has significantly grown. So actually, the pandemic has speeded that uh, process and also built a good expectation in terms of what the capabilities of the supply chain sector are going to be, not just physical delivery, but planning and making sure uh, they are becoming resilient when uh, pandemics like this could happen. The second aspect of it is what I would call from the people side. To be honest, I think uh, this sector took the largest risk. In fact, I would call them uh, the true corona warriors because right from uh, inception of the cases starting, nobody left uh, delivery or, you know, being able to provide the basic uh, services. And starting from truckers to warehouse operators to everybody, I think we're in the thick and midst of, uh, you know, making sure the uh, country got at least its basic requirements. The third aspect is actually we have seen significant growth post the first quarter or the financial year's first quarter right across the globe because people understood that planning the supply chain and outsourcing it properly is really going to benefit them, not just in the short term, but also in the long term. So if I look at, uh, you know, the same comparison, we would have had higher revenues, maybe lower profits because obviously some costs on the ground were still there, but revenues did grow also for us as we developed that. The last point I will say here is managing Singapore or managing any global operation sitting out of here, we actually found uh, both not just managing people, but also managing their KPIs became much easier because people understood that what was expected from them far better than otherwise they would have looked for instructions. Now, I think that uh, self-reliance or ability to deliver uh, on their own initiatives really started becoming the new normal. Thanks, Dinesh. You know, to give you an illustration of that, um, you know, last year, our, uh, I think in February, um, one of the, the the person who used to be our head for South Asia and based in um, uh, based in uh, Colombo uh, was moving to Pune to become our head for international more widely, um, and then because of the pandemic and so on, um, he got, ended up getting stuck in Colombo and he stayed in Colombo through the year, uh, worked perfectly effectively with all the rest of us. No one, no one really noticed that he was there. And meanwhile, his children were enrolled in a school in Pune. Um, and so they were attending the school in Pune, <laughs> living in Colombo. Um, he was meanwhile part of our management team in Pune living in Colombo as well. You know, so it was, it's just sort of happens now and it's all yeah. happens very naturally. You just gave an excellent example of online education and the boom that has happened, if you notice, in yes. uh, the startup education system in India uh, using technology. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, and uh, these, so, so that's why. So then afterwards, he was under pressure from his children to come to Pune because they, they, the children wanted to meet their friends uh, because they never physically met them, you know, <laughs> they been in class together for a year. So, uh, so I'll move to, move to Vikram. Uh, next to Vikram, uh, what's the experience been like for you? I mean, you know, you, you're in the auto sector. The auto sector uh, is this extremely tightly coupled supply chain. Um, and the sector just stopped in April, May last year. And it took a while to get uh, going again. Um, 
Uh, how have things been for for you in this in this sector, um, and uh, for Toyota Kirloska in particular? Uh, the auto sector was already in a depression before COVID started. And if you look at the numbers, uh, yesterday we had a, a meeting of our passenger council, passenger vehicle uh, CEOs council. Look at the numbers over the last 10 years. We are having some of the worst numbers over the last 10 years. Our, our volumes are uh, lower than what were seven years ago, eight years ago in different sectors, commercial vehicles, three wheelers is pathetic situation. So that's, that's the current situation. COVID, of course, was a double whammy on top of that in India. Uh, we were closed for the first couple of two, three months almost. And this year also, we were pretty much closed all of May. So, so going through this has been extremely difficult for most companies. And I would say even more for the suppliers who are supplying to the auto companies. Auto companies tend to be largely assembly, assembly shops and making the major parts. And we tend to run a supply chain of, uh, you know, um, first level suppliers, second level suppliers, tier one, tier two, tier three kind of suppliers. So it's been extremely hard for the tier two and tier three suppliers in, in this whole uh, MSMEs, basically, uh, in this whole uh, situation. Uh, what that has, so our basic struggle had been, when I take Toyota Kirloska Motor, two, two major issues for us. Ongoing uh, projects. Uh, uh, to implement new technology for cafe requirement coming up in 22 and ahead and complete product line change, as well as trying to keep your nose above water. Uh, how, how do I manage my cash flow? How do I make sure all my suppliers are, uh, are paid in irrespective and you support the suppliers, you have to support suppliers pay, make sure all your employees are paid. This, is, this has been a, a challenge. Uh, you know, luckily we we are we are a debt free company. We we run only on cash, and we had enough cash to go through. I think companies that didn't have cash to go through, I certainly had a lot of trouble in this uh, in this time. Uh, certainly, expenses came down dramatically. Travel expenses, a lot of expenses came down, uh, and and that helped with the bottom line. We could still survive. What was most interesting was new project work, uh, where we are doing complete change of technology. Uh, uh, complete change of manufacturing processes and we're spending close to about 4,000 crores along with us and a few of our suppliers in the next 12, in these 12 months as we are going on. And this would normally pertain, you know, imp uh, imp imply many experts are coming from around the world. Toyota tends to work with a group of experts who are traveling around the world and I've got people from my company also travel around the world when new installations are set up. So we, we have a pool of talented people who can do that. But this time we couldn't do that. And uh, uh, a, a lot of things we normally uh, import or parts and stuff, we could not do that. Supplies not available. So that resulted in huge amount of innovation, out of the box thinking, and we were able to get these projects running on time. I, I was so surprised to see the situation of the factory and the enthusiasm of the people who've done this. Of course, augmented reality, virtual reality has helped. But the costs have come down dramatically. High level of localization that we never imagined, and costs have come down dramatically. It's given us a huge, huge uh, lesson out of this calamity and a huge opportunity. Going forward, you know, you asked uh, something about, you know, what do you see in the future? Uh, for something in the automotive industry to increase employment, we need growth of more than 10, 15% a year. Otherwise, employment will not grow, it will only reduce. Our productivity improvements tend to be, you know, 7 8% a year. Uh, we've added 300 robots in the last 12 months. Uh, uh, so that that's the that's the issue. And so you'll have 7 8%, 10% productivity improvement going around with automation and digitalization. Lots of everything is, you know, right from the uh, person uh, buying the car to the supply chain, it's all connected. Uh, uh, it keeps on increasing, uh, not only blue collar productivity, but a lot of white collar productivity gets uh, uh, improved. Inventories are collapsing everywhere. So unless there's a huge growth in the country, I think in, in the manufacturing sector, I'm really scared about employment. Employment in the service sector is a different story. I don't want to comment. Rekha is there, uh, uh, the national comment on it. But that's, that's my big worry. We need that big mega growth uh, in the future after COVID. 
Thank you, Vikram. You know, we, we'll explore, we'll come back to the wider employment uh, question because that's a critical question for sustaining long-run growth. I mean, we have as a country the potential uh, to sustain uh, even double-digit growth for the next 30 years. Uh, we need it as a country. Um, but to do that, uh, the key question is going to be actually productive employment and seeing productive employment get deeper and deeper and deeper entrenched uh, across levels in Indian society. So we'll come back to that question. It's, a, it's an absolutely critical question. I, 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 do, I do agree. Uh, you know, one of the, uh, you talked about projects. I mean, one of the things that we, one, a product that we make is something called a condensate pump. We, we, we supply about a thousand of those a year. And invariably, our sales engineers will say, oh, we'll come and commission it for you. And of course, they wouldn't go and commission it. They'd send a service engineer. Right now, what we found, of course, is that with with the, in the experience of the last year is that you couldn't send your service engineer. And we were able to commission every one of those um, by talking to the customer on the phone. And more often than not, they commissioned it themselves. So, you know, a lot of these unnecessary activities that we have done, I think, just because of practice just went away uh, as a result of them just not being possible, uh, I think, in this, in this, in this last year. Uh, so one of the offshoots of that, what you're saying, Naushad, is yeah. product quality has increased tremendously. You cannot do a commissioning like you're saying. Hmm. And, this, and, and in the previous time, sending people and then going to not sending people, it's a direct correlation to quality of the product. Yeah. And, and a huge improvement in quality, I think, is taking place around the country with the way uh, you know, a tight market, tight uh, money requirements. And you, you can't send a guy. You have to have it right day one. You're absolutely right. You know, I mean, I think we also found that, uh, you know, because we were clear that we would not be able to visit. So you make sure that when something leaves the factory, it leaves in, you know, it leaves in... in it's complete, you know, in every respect. It just needs to be put in place, connected, and switched on. <laughs> so, and I'm, while you're talking physical products, I mean, if I take our industry and if I take our experience in Accenture, same thing. You know, we're delivering large scale transformation projects, whether you know, it's helping the Italian National Procurement Agency uh, develop a recovery plan or DuPont doing its, you know, new business reinvention, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all being done from here, offshore, seamlessly, dirt complete, right? Mm -hmm. And there are no people flying in there to uh, execute on the project. And therefore, you're absolutely right. Our, the way we work has changed so dramatically for all of us. Uh, and how much of this will go forward is something we need to sort of think about uh, and plan for. So, you know, how, what's, your, what's, your own, what's your own prognosis of what's going to happen going forward? Uh, uh, are we going to are we going to return? You know, everyone says that. Look, a lot of these good practices are going to stick. Um, how do we ensure they do? I mean, what are the things that we need to do in our companies to ensure that as people start meeting physically again, the inclination is not um, oh, well. You know, the expectation is show up for a meeting. What do you mean you're going to be on a VC? Um, you know, never mind if you're somewhere else. You know. Come, come here for a meeting. I mean, how do we, how do we ensure that um, that those good practices that we've learned, uh, sort of, we've been forced to learn this last year stick? Uh, if I can take a chance uh, yeah. answering that, because we uh, tend to discuss this now quite a bit, because when you think that travel is going to start opening up, whether we are going to get back to, and like Rekha said, in our case, it's also physical delivery or physical implementation, right? But I think what I have realized now is there is a 100% acceptance across levels that we are not going to go back to back to where we were. Now, it's a very uh, difficult question to look at whether we will uh, start doing certain things still getting connected physically. And my view is maybe it is good to get back to maybe 20-30% of where we were earlier in terms of having that connect because that does give 
the feel and what I would call uh, the touch factor in terms of getting to know what is happening at the ground level. But I don't think we are going to go back to uh, what I would call the olden practices because it's a mindset change has happened. And I think this has been long enough and people have actually liked what they see here. So that's my uh, view. No, in fact, what we are doing is we are now build, building into our next few years plans a hybrid work model, a constantly connected work model. So we're putting what we've learned into our new structure and planning, which includes, you know, connected all uh, everywhere, how many people come to work, what do we do with our real estate, uh, you know, all of those issues are currently being planned for. So we are doing that. But that also means that we have to be careful. It has an opportunity because in our case, for example, you can therefore um, work from anywhere. Uh, you can also hire from anywhere. So it gives you a larger talent pool to look at, whether it's tier two cities, tier three cities, or, you know, getting more flexible work for women, for example. But it also then has, we have to look at the downside. What does it do to your culture? What does it do to innovation? What does it do to security? So it has to be a balance and it has to be a very thought through balance. So that's something we're working on definitely. See, one of the, uh, uh, you know, we'll certainly be able to go with the same method of working for some time. We've got rid of our corporate office. You know, there, there are a lot of things that are going. There, there are a couple of challenges I see going ahead though. One is as we recruit new people, and as the technology in our industry, which is our big challenge, keeps changing. At present, we rely on, you know, we have not done much recruitment in the last so many uh, uh, years, the same people, the highly process driven com uh, company. And uh, you, you know and you trust the person on the other side of the screen. But you get into a large yeah. amount of new people uh, and you're not confident that guy follows the same process as you do. So that level of trust to build up takes time. And that's going to be a challenge if you say we are, we'll only work with augmented reality or virtual reality and things like that. I think that's going to be a challenge. So I'd love to continue like this for a long time. But how to get over those challenges yes. as large recruitment starts is, is, uh, is one uh, uh, big worry for me. Uh, second, you know, on the, uh, the Toyota was known for go and see any problem, go physically to the site and see it. Toyota recently made a very interesting statement. It said, don't go and see anywhere. Only reason to travel and meet someone is if you have to say sorry. So that was <laughs> <laughs> That's very a very simple, clear policy, policy direction. <laughs> yeah, what you're pointing out is a mixed model, really. I mean, it will not be completely virtual. It will not be this thing. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to add that we've actually had the experience. So just last quarter, Accenture hired 32,000 people. Yes. Right? And which means that you're bringing all of them on board virtually. You're building teams and culture virtually. Um, and uh, you're building trust virtually. And it's a huge learning experience. And there are a lot of practices that we will carry forward and some will have to change completely from what we to do in the past. So how, you know, so, so this precise point of building culture virtually is something I struggle with. You know, it's the, uh, uh, you know, doing a meeting online, um, probably more effective than doing it physically, you know, um, especially a, a sort of mid-sized meeting, you know, eight, 10 people, uh, it works really, really, really well online. Um, what I miss are the, the informal chit chat, you know, five, 10 minutes before a meeting, five, 10 minutes after meeting, when a lot of uh, useful information and um, unconstructed information gets exchanged. Um, you know, uh, you get a feel of what's going on. Um, and also then, uh, those connections that get built, that builds trust, that builds relationships. Um, how do you, how do you build culture in an organization virtually, I I I worry about that. I uh, I worry about the integration of new people um, in a in a virtual world. <laughs> um, you know, people as you say, people who've been around Vikram. You know, people who've been around for twenty years, thirty years. You've known them really, really well for twenty years. Uh, you know, in, in manufacturing. <laughs> Uh, sorry to interrupt. No, no, this is very critical in a manufacturing line. Yeah. Uh, probably in, a, in, in, in any any supply chain, uh, where you're adding, you know, you're you're doing some activity at some 
point in the supply chain and you're handing it over to the next customer in the chain all the way through and we look at it that way and we look at a zero uh, the, the the ideal supply chain where based on trust you accept that the supplier is supplying the next customer a zero ppm product that's that that tends to be the culture of you know the best culture in manufacturing if you can get to that level and to build up that especially physically when you're producing something and you're you're delivering it to the next process and say it's zero ppm and you trust me it's zero ppm without uh, uh, inspection you know that that kind of culture to build up is very very i think difficult virtually it, for people in manufacturing we are working in factories we need to we need to do it on site there is no other way but that and that's what our customers expect i think the same in the, the same in the supply chain side as well i think what we said and i think if you especially connect with your what i would call vendor suppliers that becomes absolutely essential to at least get to know them so i think that's where i believe the hybrid will come in how much of a hybrid is of course a different question yeah yeah, yeah. There's a lot more investment on one-to-one conversations because you can't exactly, as you said, do the ten-minute here and the ten-minute there and the you know over lunch just have an informal chat and get to know them. So to make sure that you're uh, beyond the meeting, it's not transactional anymore. It's it's a lot more investment. Um, I can I can see what I'm doing differently, and it is huge amount of investment to connect and build trust virtually. You know, let's 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 go on to the question of in of employment. uh people um it relates a little bit to what we've been talking about in terms of people within our organization uh and some of the things that we did and which you referred to uh of looking after people both direct and indirect uh even when we were under very under under various lockdowns um the the biggest concern for the indian economy going forward is you know is going to be can we create enough employment um to more than absorb the 10 12 million people that come into the workforce each year um and this is a question of how skilled and capable we ensure they are uh and it's a question of whether we can create enough opportunities to absorb them uh and in the past most people in the indian economy have got employed in relatively informal occupations as vikram spoke about this you know that manufacturing has created uh, high value added jobs it's created highly productive jobs but it's not created directly itself in its own factories um huge numbers of jobs in india at least um we've created more jobs uh in all the services that actually live off those uh highly productive manufacturing plants um so how do you see the employment situation you know in the next year uh in the country do you see employment recovering especially given that we've had you know people in informal jobs people in uh, informal services uh in small small restaurants uh um transporters etc uh vikram mentioned three wheelers uh you know the the single biggest uh, uh non performing uh loan uh for finance companies is actually loans three wheelers because they've just had no no work to do i mean they've not they've not they not be able to work so how do you see that playing out over the next uh, uh year or so um do you see this bouncing back do you see this uh, continuing to be sort of up and down how do you how do you see this uh, evolving yes sir yeah so i said let me start with my optimistic view uh, because as an indus and then we get into the more realistic uh, assessments because if i look at our industry not just accenture but technology as a whole we've been actually a net hire uh, in the last year uh, and uh, uh, 140000 new hires just last year as an industry and a strong commitment with aggressive hiring for the next year all of us have you know said we're going to hire 20000 people etc cetera, etc cetera, and published our numbers so there's hiring is in terms of numbers employment is going to be high for our industry and for accenture our problem is slightly different 
uh, is very different actually. It's the skilling because there's demand for digital talent, but it's about eight times the current pool. So for us, the issue is we need different investment in skilling, in broad basing our talent sourcing, in building a talent pipeline at our schools and college level. And I know you said you wanted to talk about education. We should talk about that because till we change that, it's not going to happen. So for us, it's more a supply issue. Demand is there. Um, and there's a second point, which is really that you're right for every one uh, technology uh, job that we create, there are subsidiary jobs that get created, which in the current pandemic have gotten depressed, whether it was the transport person who transport our people to our offices, whether it was a cafeteria, whether you know the old support staff, that has tamped down until we can all come back to office, even partially, those jobs are gone, right? So that is an issue. So for us, it's a dual issue. So, yeah. now yes. if I can just add uh, a couple of points here, because obviously, like you said, transport or the three-wheeler is something which actually pertains directly to our uh, sector. And what we have found is that as the percentage of outsourcing goes up, new opportunities come. And this can, you know, come in places like, uh, example is uh, to uh, e-commerce side. But if you look at even the B2B side, as we look at, moving more into uh, what I would call service at the place of uh, where people reside or people work, I have actually found uh, that the employment actually has gone up. Even in our company's case, we are actually recruiting. And I think I agree that uh, making people ready for the new normal uh, and so to say digitally enabled uh, practices is something which we have to work on. But I feel as a large corporate, it is our duty and responsibility to make sure that we equally work with, on creating employment with our partners. Because that's where they will have a big challenge going forward, especially the transfer side as a classical example. Thanks. Yeah, the, you know, one, if I can make a comment, yes. about 20, 25 years ago, when the software industry started taking off in Bangalore, and uh, we were all amazed at how much money all the software engineers were getting paid. So I kept, I, I used to worry at some point, will we be able to recruit people in the manufacturing sector? And then I had sort of a long-term game plan in my mind, saying that I have to exceed my value addition per person beyond the software industry. Otherwise, I'll never be able to recruit that, yeah. recruit the people uh, uh, for, for ourselves, and we won't be able to pay them properly. And we could do that. In the manufacturing industry, we could go on a high uh, increase in productivity. I, I think we have, we have exceeded the productivity and the value addition per employee in our industry compared to most of the other industries this way. It's also resulted in a, in a change of employment in the sense the uh, 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 number of people has come down per car, for example. Number of hours per car has come down dramatically over the years. But the, the sector which manufactures very high-tech products in automation, in robotics, in all kinds of those kind of services has increased also significantly. Things which you do with your hand is coming with uh, uh, from equipment, but that also requires employment. So I think that way is going to balance. But I think to, to, to my mind, the challenge in India of employment in the manufacturing sector is scaling up. We need to get to world-class scale in, in production, uh, which means that much demand has to start coming up here, somehow manage exports. Uh, there are closed borders all over the world. So it's going to be a challenge on employment in the manufacturing sector. I think in the other areas, tourism, many other areas we have to explore to ensure that we get our uh, employment up. Thanks, Vikram. You know, the last, as the last topic, uh, you know, one of the, uh, if I had to compare two countries. Uh, the, the two countries that I would compare, uh, you know, India and Singapore. Singapore is a very small place, yeah. Um, but it's also, a, it's also a country which looks after its people extremely well. Um, and I'm always reminded of uh, a comment that my grandfather used to make about doing business in Ahmedabad. In, um, and he used to always say that if you can do business in Ahmedabad, you can do business anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, and he's not, he wasn't the only one who said that. And they say that 
more broadly about India. They say that if you can do business and succeed in India, you can do business pretty well anywhere in the world because you learn to be resilient. Um, you know, you you cope with whatever gets thrown at you uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and that builds uh, that builds real strength and real resilience uh, in the in in longer run. Um, and Singapore sort of you know it, it really looked. I mean, I I understand that when they went in for their um, lockdowns, you know, companies didn't even need to apply for uh, labor support. They just got checks in the mail. Um, you know, covering a percentage of their uh, of their salary bill, um, which is you know unimaginable, unimaginable for those of us <laughs> living and working in India. Uh, and I just wondered uh, if you could reflect on how your experience of working in India has made your company, specifically in India, has made your company more resilient, has made your company a stronger, leaner, tougher. Um, more, more, what's the word, more battle-proof uh, enterprise. So if I can uh, start the answer there, uh, Naushad, I, I really feel it is uh, the digital requirement change which the pandemic has brought about, which is really the advantage for uh, India and Indian businesses, right? Two reasons for that. One is the fact that technology usage is always something which everybody is being used to, but the way we, like I said, the way we interact between business to business, the way we interact with uh, our customers, I think has become completely different once we adopted to the digital world. And I think, I mean, I mean, digital world, it's no more laptops and PCs, but actually the phone, right? So if I start with that as the base as to why I believe uh, doing business in India, especially during the pandemic, would have helped uh, or will help our companies or Indian companies to be able to not just face global competition, but actually grow globally as well, adopting some of these practices because it's something which is actually what the uh, customer also wants. That's number one. Number two, because of this big mindset shift in terms of uh, wanting to get into a slightly lower cost solutions all across the globe, because they are also under pressure for, uh, you know, once the economy comes back to normal, I feel that the practices we have adopted here in terms of providing good low-cost solutions then become potentially transferable to other global markets using this. So I think these are the two takeaways for me from the pandemic. Right. Thank you. Thanks. If I can add to that, building on what Dinesh said, one, I absolutely agree. You were talking about uh, you know innovation and how we've all become battle uh, ready. Uh, if I look at the number of new technology related startups that happened in the last year to deliver healthcare. Just let's take healthcare, which was a big issue, right? And we talked about education earlier and to, uh, 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 to uh, deliver education online to the remotest areas of India, whether it was the government efforts uh, or it was the private efforts. That's a great example of technology, frugality, innovation, all coming together. And that could be the game changer for us in India because we can take this forward uh, across very easily and can easily be adopt adopted and we already have those capabilities. So that would be the one thing I would focus on if I had to, which is our deep tech ecosystem, our Google innovation, our, uh, uh, our ingenuity, of course, and expertise. And, of course, our talent. Thank you, Rick. Thanks. Thanks. Thank That's you. quickly last statement. Two things for me. I think is are going to help us for the future. One, of course, the pandemic-related uh, uh, work which we did in, in capital equipment, localization, and, and getting to a new cost base, which we hope we can continue in the same manner. And the second thing over the last couple of years, uh, especially with the, uh, uh, the tough uh, situation in the auto market, we did, a, uh, as well as the demand of carbon neutrality around the world, uh, two areas for us are very critical, product carbon neutrality and manufacturing carbon neutrality. I think we've achieved on the manufacturing side, to a large extent, uh, carbon neutrality uh, in, in India, at least in, our, in all our plants with ourselves, with dealers. We are, we're getting closer and closer to that in the supply chain. Uh, on the products, I think the investments we're making now is going to help us go towards a lower carbon footprint uh, in the next few years. That's a harder one. 
each country's uh, energy mix is different. Uh, it's very hard to take the same technology and put it around the world because of each country's energy mix. That's the hard challenge. But I think the work we've done, especially in, in the, on the environment side, on, on the carbon side, uh, and this uh, localization side will take us ahead. Uh, I, I feel very comfortably and I'm very optimistic about that. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I, know, we're, I know we're all out of time, uh, but I just wanted to thank you all three for your comments and insights. Um, the message that I get from what you've said is that each of your firms has come through these 16 months uh, in better shape, uh, that each of the firms, uh, some were very well prepared uh, and used to living a digital ex existence. Uh, others learned uh, very suddenly on the fly, but uh, uh, have come through in really good shape at the end of it. Uh, and it would seem that, you know, then this reflects what we read in the papers as well, that, uh, uh, that stronger companies uh, have emerged from these 16 months even stronger uh, with, uh, with even more resilient enterprises and not only resilient enterprises, but enterprises with new skill sets that uh, will be really valuable going forward. The question uh, more broadly for India will be uh, if we collectively between us uh, can combine to build that depth of talent, that depth of skills, that depth of, uh, uh, of inclusiveness uh, in our growth processes so that we can include the wider population uh, in, our, in our growth processes. Because if we can figure that out, uh, then we have a secure future, not just for the next year, but for the next 30 years. So thank you again very much for your, uh, for your participation this morning. Thank you for being a great audience and uh, uh, wish you a very good uh, rest of this program. Thanks. Thank you. Thank um, you. Bye.